Now we're starting. Yeah. Woo! Finally, so, last event today. Yep. <laughs> Getting the card. Moving on to the last session of the day before we jump into the happy hour. So we're going to spend some time uh, to hear from some of the maintainers, some of our key contributors on how, how you can help, how you can be more involved in the project, what the various, all the things you can do to help, all the areas where you can help. And some of the cool things that are going on in the project. So I'm gonna hand it over to the GSC and Alex to kick it off. Yeah. Thanks, Henry. Okay. Um thank you. All right. Um, I'm just here to kick things off, but uh, this session is about how to get started contributing to Argo. Um, so we'll go over what it's like to make a code contribution. I know it can be pretty daunting. Um, and so hopefully this will make things a little was scary. Uh, but if you do take one thing away from this um, session is that you don't have to be a developer to contribute to Argo. You know, we have folks just focusing on documentation, uh, marketing, security. Uh, so there's a lot of different areas to contribute. Um, and so as you know, Argo has two tracks, like CD rollouts and workflow and events. Um, so every week there is a um, Argo CD rollouts meeting on Thursdays. Um, this for is technical discussions. Um, and similarly on workflow front, it's not every week, but um, workflows has a, I think bi-weekly meeting on um, workflow uh, related issues and technical discussions. Um, there's, and I don't, you'll have to look on the calendar for all of these, but there's meetings focused specifically on like the UI. Uh, of course we have like the monthly community meetings, which is kind of more targeted for, um, you know, more general public and less main maintainers. Um, and other things like marketing committee and um, uh, even one focus on security. Um, so uh, if you're interested in becoming a member, um, if you go to the Argo Proj umbrella repo, uh, there is a membership markdown file that kind of outlines all the um, steps that it takes to um, uh, become like transition through like member or reviewer or approver. Um, and so there's basically, um, you know, we're looking for people who kind of have a continued uh, presence and contribution, whether that be in Slack or, or issues or answering discussions or, um, and just kind of show um, that you're in there for the, the long haul. And then, um, you know, we proactively meet like, at, try to meet like every least like once a quarter uh, where the maintainers try to identify people in the community that are, you know, um, hey, I know this is, the person is, has made a lot of uh, uh, PR, so they, uh, maybe they'd be interested in, in, in joining as a member. Um, but also if you're interested in be, being a member, just like, you know, reach out, speak to us and say, hey, what can I do um, to, to contribute? Um, so, I think some some other tips. Um, I know it's hard to get attention of, of maintainers, so I find it effective to kind of show up to uh, some of these contributors meetings and and just get in our face and, and actually raise issues, add things to the agenda, uh, especially that will that will you know bring things uh, to the forefront if that needs discussions. Um, and we do try to tag um, issues as good first issue. So if you're just kind of looking for things to get started on, first thing you should do is, you know, filter the issues list with the uh, good first issue tag. Um, and I think the last part of contributing, and I think you'll have, I'll have to defer to Henrik, but we do have like the whole corporate track, right? Corporate uh, contribution. But, um, and so, you know, the people code fresh and Red Hat and Acuity, like BlackRock, if you're if you have a organization a corporate and, uh, that wants to get involved um, we have you know ways to uh, join us there so um, I think that's all I had Alex is gonna start introducing the various people uh, presenting today thank you thank you Jesse so uh, one more time I'm Alex and I'm a maintainer of Argo CG project and uh, so we're going to have five speakers today. That's why I have a job to introduce uh, all of them. And first speaker is uh, Regina Valoshin. 
She actually is not here, but she's going to present virtually. We have a video recorded. Uh, and uh, Regina, she a long time user of Argo CD, and she was so excited about the features that Argo CD provides. So eventually she decided to contribute. And with that, I think it's time to play the video. And she will introduce herself and tell you her story. Hi, everyone. My name is Regina, and I'm a huge GitOps fan. I'm also a cloud platform team leader in Bank of Bali. Since I was a child, I was always the only female somewhere, the only girl in class, one of the few women lecturing in DevOps areas. And lately, I have become one of the few female open source contributors. Yes, this is a shout out to you ladies to participate as well. As you can see, I'm also outnumbered in my own family. Uh, I have one, one merge pull request to Argo CD repository. For such a tiny achievement, why is this worth any of your time? And why should you even care? I wanna share my experience as a junior contributor and the great value this journey had both for me and my company, Banca Boli. Why I decided to become a contributor. In 2020, I had an Argo CD performance issue managing remote OpenShift clusters. Alexander M set a Zoom with me to identify the problem. He had a fix ready in two days only. That was mind blown. The support was much better than for products I pay for. And so I decided I must give back. But that didn't happen for quite some time. And let's see why. Contributing looked scary and beyond my level. I had windows on my laptop. <laughs> I had windows on my laptop. <laughs> I used VirtualBox and installed a VM. But that VM wouldn't start with some weird error, and I found nothing about how to fix it. So I set an EC2 instance in an AWS account, and then I managed to build the code. But then I had to spin an IDE. I tried to install the IDE on the same EC2 instance, and that was obviously the wrong path. At that point, I knew nothing about VS Code remote extensions. So the environment was not working. I didn't know Golang. I was afraid of asking stupid questions on Slack. I was also afraid of leaving my comfort zone. I was even more afraid of touching code that was absolutely new to me. So why did I eventually dare them? When we started using Argo CD in the bank, the UI was only accessed by my team. Later on, the developers required access as well. The security team was highly concerned about pod logs being public in the UI. They required log access control prior to developers using Argo CD in production. And the requirement seemed beneficial for other users as well. And so my excuses for not having contributed so far have come to an end. Living comfort zone and time zone. I wrote a proposal for the feature and put it up the shared community meeting agenda documents. I checked the date of the meeting four times and the time different five times. When I entered the meeting, I was two hours late nevertheless. <laughs> Luckily, they still discussed it without me and decided they want this feature. So this is contribution reality vs how it looked like in my mind in the beginning. Working with four people took longer than I expected. I was forgetting to sign off the commits and had to recreate my branch often. I also didn't work efficiently with pulling changes from master. And so I had to reapply my changes frequently. The environment setup took longer than I expected. However, Windows on my laptop turned out to be a much smaller problem. Using tips from both my bank colleagues and the community, I installed WSL2 with Docker for desktop and VS Code with remote extensions. People actually go that path and it works. Didn't know Golang. 
a much smaller issue. I come from a Java background, so Golang was quite different for me. I chose the path of learning only Go basics and then learning more from Argo CD examples. Even after contributing, I still cannot say that I know Golang well, but now I feel comfortable reading and understanding Go code. Asking stupid questions on Slack was also a much smaller problem. I assumed that Argo CD maintainers deal with junior contributors all the time, and so beginner questions were normal. When I was stuck, I explored the problem and tried various solutions on my own, and I also used the debugger a lot. But once those were done and things were still not working, I asked for help in the Slack contributors channel, and people were very responsive and very welcoming. They even set Zoom sessions with me to help me progress. <laughs> Afraid of touching new code, also a much smaller problem. I programmed by example, meaning I started with identifying the components that had similar functionality to what I had to implement. And then I followed the code to understand the architecture and the general flow. The same about the tests. Leaving my comfort zone, turned to be challenging and rewarding. Next, I will cover the inspiring insights from participating in Argo project, which I have partially implemented in my company. OSS projects had covered long before we had even heard that word. It means that they had to deal with people being remote to each other, working in different time zones and hardly sharing an office while the rest of the world started dealing with the remote challenge of sharing knowledge and design decisions and common context effectively only in 2020. OSS projects already have a mature methodology for that. This can be argued, but as I see it, this mature methodology is mostly around managing GitHub issues correctly. We adopted Argo CD issues categories and templates. I have explored how Argo CD GitHub issues are categorized and managed and incorporated that in some of our projects. So now in my team, we have clear categories and templates for the issues we manage. And we are in the process of changing the mindset towards making GitLab issues a source of design decisions. Based on what I have learned from Argo CD CI CD pipeline, we have adopted the following in my team. Pre-release and release Git tags. Categorized GitLab message re merge request commit message prefixes. Release auto creation by invoking GitLab API. The logs RBAC feature was definitely not a good first issue. <laughs> that innocent change turned out to be a breaking change. Unless explicitly allowed, it would have disabled overall UI access to pod logs. And so a transition release with a feature gate was needed. The change management at configuration, upgrade instructions, and release blog levels has taught me a lot. Why did my pipeline fail? New configuration was introduced, but no relevant documentation changes were added. This was mind blowing for me. It makes you rethink automation. We will adopt this in the future. This is how I felt when my pull request was merged. <laughs> and this is not even half of how excited I was upgrading our Argo CD to the version with my lines of code. So what's next? More pull requests for me, further promoting OSS contributions in my company. So to wrap it up, we use OSS because it is successful and because we trust it. When we contribute, we learn the methodology that makes OSS successful. We can then incorporate that methodology in our own companies, making our products better. Contributing is very exciting because the whole community benefits from that. Contributing makes us leave the comfort zone and grow. Even a small one-time contribution can have a big impact.
Thank you so much. Awesome presentation. I'm not sure if it was recorded, but I, if not, then we'll just tell Regina how welcome her presentation was. Okay, and uh, our next speaker is uh, Julie Vogel. And she is going to have, uh, talk about uh, Argo workflows code base. Yeah, uh, contributing to Argo workflows and events. All right, this is blinking again. <laughs> what did you do? <laughs> All right, you have a magic touch, I guess. Okay, yeah, so I'm from Workflows and Events and um, I was asked to talk because I have the newbie perspective, uh, because I've basically been working on workflows for the last five months and then for three months before that on events. Um, but uh, disclaimer, like if, if anything I say is wrong, please feel free to interrupt me. <laughs> Hopefully not. But, um, okay, so uh, you know, basically, you'll find that all the Argo projects, I think, are under github.com slash Argo proj, and that includes one for Argo workflows, one for Argo events. Um, so uh, if you're looking to contribute, maybe you're somebody that already has your own need, right? You're using it, and there's either an enhancement that you want to see um, that's not getting addressed, or maybe there's a bug that you need fixing. Um, so please, we welcome all the contributions if you do. Um, but if you don't, then uh, you know there are plenty that you can find if you go to GitHub issues. Um, just find one that's unassigned. Uh, we ask people to put a thumbs up on any issue um, that they're interested in. Uh, so the popular ones have more thumbs up. Um, and then consider a good first issue. I'm not sure if everybody knows what that is, um, but basically there's a tag, um, you know, which if you go to a label, I should say. So there's a good first issue label there. Um, so yeah, I mean, there are plenty of code fixes, uh, bug, bugs and enhancements that could be addressed, um, but documentation too, you know, um, we have, uh, our documentation is also on those same repos and that gets published uh, to um, a site that, that shows all the documentation. So if you wanna help us improve that, that's definitely welcome. Um, okay, so before you start, uh, fork the repository and create your branch off of that. Um, if it is a big change, you probably should first uh, bring it up like in a GitHub discussion. Um, that's also, you know, on the repo here is this list of discussions here. So you can start a discussion or even bring it to one of those um, workflows and events de developers meetings that Jesse mentioned. Um, just because, you know, I've seen people uh, submit PRs for features and then the response they get is basically, oh, well, it would have been better if it were done this other way, <laughs> right? So I don't want anyone to, you know, waste time. If it's something significant enough, you may want to go that route first. Um, okay, so while you're making the changes, um, what you'll find is in our documentation, we actually have, um, we have this developer guide here, uh, developer guide tab. Uh, and then, you know, 
there's a page here called running locally. So this gives you, you know, basically the instructions for, for how to run things locally. Um, so like our workflow controller and our Argo server actually run just bare metal on your machine instead of in a, uh, a separate pod. It just makes the development easier, right? Um, okay, let's see. Um, so yeah, if you have questions, which I'm sure you will, um, then you know, feel free to bring those up in the GitHub discussions that I mentioned before um, or in these CNCF Slack channels. Um, and then please, you know, if uh, do add unit tests um, and then if applicable, end-to-end -end test. Uh, let me present this so it's easier to see. Okay, so you're ready to submit your pull request. Um, you know, basically we've just got kind of a checklist of things you need to do. Um, first of all, pull request should start with the keyword, uh, either feet, fix, docs, or chore. Um, and then if there's an issue uh, that's either a bug or an enhancement that your PR is tied to, then, um, you know, usually writing fixes and then the, the number of the issue uh, is good. So then it'll automatically, you know, link them together. Um, sign the commit uh, as well. Um, you can look up how to do that on in GitHub if, if uh, you don't know. Um, and then also we have a lot of things that get auto-generated uh, based on changes um, and then things that get checked as well. So uh, by running this make pre-commit dash B, you can do all of that stuff. Um, if you don't, what tends to happen basically is the CI will run in GitHub on your PR and you'll just see that there are various things that have failed. So you can always go and look and see, well, what did fail and, and try to address any issues in there. Um, so one thing to mention is we have so many tests that automatically get run as part of our CI mm -hmm. that some of them unfortunately uh, fail on occasion <laughs> due to timing issues. And so that's something we want to resolve. Uh, but just note that, yeah, if you have a CI failure, it may be your failure, it may not be. So um, if you think it's not, then uh, you can basically issue an empty commit, uh, which you can look up if you haven't done that before, but um, to re-trigger the CI to hopefully get it to pass. Um, okay. So just kind of going over the general architecture of Argo workflows. This might be a little hard to see, um, but you know, really the main thing you need to run Argo workflows is the workflow controller itself. Um, you know, that's going to basically be looking for your workflow CRD objects and you know creating the appropriate pods out of them and everything. Um, you can also run an Argo server, which enables you to use the UI um, and also, you know, use the REST API and the uh, client SDKs, which use the REST API. Um, but anyway, this, so this is a general diagram for the different components of Argo workflows. Um, so by the way, this is um, in that same, why am I not seeing this whole thing? reload this. Oh yeah, so this is under developer guide as well. Um, if you want to take a closer look at what's in here, there are a few diagrams in here. Um, we, uh, you know, your container actually runs as part of a pod, which includes three containers. So um, the one that your container is, the user supplied container is running in is called the main container. Um, and then there's also this init container and a wait container. So the init container will preload um, 
any incoming parameters or artifacts that uh, that the pod needs um, as defined in the template. Um, and the weight container will do the reverse and it'll um, make sure that any uh, output parameters and artifacts get saved off. Um, but if you're looking at any of that stuff, that's kind of what's going on under the hood. Um, actually, what's interesting is we, we take your container and we actually um, put our process, uh, we volume mount our process into it and it actually launches your command as a subprocess. Um, and then, yeah, so this diagram kind of just shows the main flow of operation within the workflow controller. Um, I mean, basically what's happening is there's a queue, or I guess a couple of queues that uh, the controller is, is working on just like, you know, processing all of these workflow changes um, that have occurred. Uh, so, okay, let's see. All right, just some key files to be aware of. Uh, sorry, this is getting pretty detailed, but um, workflow types. This is uh, kind of where your where the workflow spec is defined. Uh, Controller.go is um, sort of the main loop, which is you know processing uh, that queue of workflow uh, changes. Um, Operator.go is called by Controller.go to basically process a workflow. Um, and then down here, Argo Server.go is uh, you know basically setting up the um, HTTP listener, you know, that's listening for uh, messages coming from the UI or, or from the REST API. Um, and then, sorry, this is the last slide. I, these, these two slides will probably be more useful for anybody that's looking at the slides later <laughs> than right now. But this is kind of just, you know, sort of the key directories um, within Argo workflows. Um, and by the way, yeah, I'm mentioning Argo workflows a lot here. I haven't really talked much about Argo events. I think that's because there's a lot more work to do on Argo workflows. Um, but uh, yeah, so key directories, um, you know, this command Argo is basically where, you know, the Argo CLI stuff is. Uh, command Argo exec is for the executor, which is running in the workflow pods. Um, docs is self-explanatory examples, you know, it just has a whole ton of, um, like workflow YAML files, um, that you can run, uh, manifests basically uses customize to, uh, deploy workflows, um, in a few different, uh, scenarios, um, Package API client provides uh, the REST interface as well as the Go SDK, which is using the REST interface. Um, server is where the Argo server logic lives. And then workflow controller is where all the workflow controller logic lives. And I think that's my last slide. Yeah. Any questions or anything? I don't know if I ran over time, but. <laughs> If we, we have time, and we okay. plan to open for questions after the oh, oh, okay. uh, after the last speaker. So, thanks a lot, Judy. For uh, sure, I would not. Uh, it's not my experience. I think the last two slides could be way more useful than you think about. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I want to introduce the next speaker. Uh, I cannot see him here for some reason. <laughs> oh, Dan, Dan got it. Yes, he uh, contributed a lot of things to Argo, <coughs> including making sure each and every person who uses Kubernetes knows about Argo. So he is going to talk about marketing. Perfect, okay. yes. Everyone's favorite topic, marketing. 
Uh, so for those that aren't aware, we started a, a program within Argo some time ago to introduce special interest groups. And the two special interest groups that we created, there's already a special interest group for UI, um, which uh, someone else is gonna talk about. And we started a special interest group for security, um, because as you know, we've been doing a lot of focus on the project and improving security, which also someone else will talk about. And we also started a special interest group for marketing. And that group is responsible for doing things like running ArgoCon and uh, managing webinars, reviewing blog posts, all these kinds of things. And so this is a really great area to get involved if you're interested in DevRel um, or a lot of, I mean, I think most of the people here are very technical, but you may have people on your team that are less technical that are interested in contributing to open source. And in the SIG marketing group, we have a mix of very technical people and very non-technical people. Um, for example, one of the people that helped put on ArgoCon uh, from the CodeFresh team is uh, Sharon. And Sharon is not a programmer. She doesn't know anything about programming. She's an events manager. And so she helped organize to make sure that we had the right buildings, worked with the CNCF, all of these kinds of things. So the opportunity is there, no matter what kind of contributions you wanna do. If you can't do, if you, if you were watching that last talk and you were thinking, this is too hard. <laughs> um, uh, if you were unconvinced by the ease of use of that experience and you're thinking, I still want to contribute, um, but maybe I can contribute in a different way. Maybe I can do more blog posts. Maybe I can uh, go out and talk about Argo. Maybe I can help with events. Maybe I can help run a meetup. Um, any of those kinds of things, SIG marketing is the place to be. Uh, and so to get into SIG marketing, all of the SIG information is on the, uh, on the Argo calendar. Does, it, does everybody know where the Argo project calendar is? Raise your hand if you know that there is an Argo project calendar. Okay, so maybe I should have had a slide to tell you where to find that. Um, if you go to github.com slash Argo project slash Argo project, it's Argo proj slash Argo proj, it's abbreviated. Um, there's a link to the calendar and you can add that calendar to your Google calendar and it will show you all of the Argo meetings that are happening, the Argo maintainer meetings, the contributor experience meetings, as well as the SIG meetings. Uh, SIG marketing meets twice monthly, I believe. Um, I think it's like every other week. And then uh, SIG, mark SIG security is like every other week. And someone else will talk about SIG UI. But uh, at any rate, um, that's the basic pitch. Any questions about SIG marketing? No. No in-depth technical review of that. OK, great. So with that, uh, do you want to introduce the next speaker? Yes. Okay, thank you. Two more speakers, and uh, one is going to talk about one more uh, uh, C group, uh, Remington Briggs. So, Remington uh, contributes a ton of UI changes in Argo CD, and he's leader of uh, UX C group in, in Argo project. Thank you, Alex. Not working for me. I'm gonna top it. I swear. No. Ah, there he is. <laughs> All right, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you, Alex, for the introduction. Uh, I'm Remington, uh, and as Alex said, uh, I lead the SIG UI group. Um, and so today I'm going to talk a little bit about how to contribute to Argo UI. Um, so I want to start off with saying that. There are two main ways that you can contribute. As Dan said, it's not always just code. Um, you can contribute in a lot more ways than just code. Um, so on the left here, I have the React logo. So if you know any React, which is code, um, that's going to be the main way with which you contribute to the Argo UI. 
Um, but you can also contribute on GitHub, which is why I have the GitHub logo. Um, so you can contribute by opening uh, GitHub issues, by uh, contributing to discussions, um, by creating proposals. Um, and then further in the community meetings, um, you can come to the uh, SIG UI meetings. Uh, you can come to the general contributor meetings to talk about your UI ideas and complaints, um, as I'm sure there are many. Uh, all right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the current state as well. Um, so first, we have the CD UI. Um, Argo CD's UI is fairly mature um, and fairly stable as well. Um, we also have the Workflows UI, uh, which has had quite a bit of features. Uh, you'll see later in the presentation, I'll uh, show you a little bit of the state of Workflows UI. Um, but I think Workflows is where we need a lot of help. So if you're looking to contribute uh, to Argo UI, please help us in Workflows. Um, and then the Rollus UI, which has this dashboard, which is relatively new uh, as of a, about a year and a half ago. Um, and it's continuing to improve and evolve. Uh, Jesse spoke earlier about how uh, the dashboard is, uh, we hope to add a login feature uh, or authentication rather. Um, and then finally, uh, this is maybe the most important area in which you guys can contribute. Uh, so this is the shared library between all of the Argo UIs. Um, so CD workflows and rollouts, events doesn't have a UI, um, but all of these projects use Argo UI's re repository. Um, and it's also fairly stable, but it is fragmented. We have um, several sets of components that are not shared. Um, so improvement here is going to be improvement for all three of these projects. So uh, your efforts would be multiplied if you, if you do decide to contribute to Argo UI. Um, all right, so moving on, I'm going to talk about three key areas. Uh, I sort of went over two of them already, uh, but I also want to talk about extensions. Um, but before I do that, I would like to speak a little bit about why I think UI is important for Argo. Um, so we all know that Kubernetes is very complex, um, and Argo has, oops. Oh, no. Oh, all right. Uh, Argo has uh, sort of reduced some of that complexity, uh, or rather it's introduced abstractions that we all use to leverage the complexity of Kubernetes. Um, but Argo is also very complex. Uh, and so the UI sort of reduces the cognitive load uh, that is required for using Argo. Um, and I think that the UI is sort of Argo's superpower in a lot of ways. Um, and it is an advantage that we offer that a lot of other projects don't trying to do the same things. Um, and I think it makes Argo more powerful, um, and it makes Kubernetes more approachable. Uh, all right, so moving on uh, to the first of my three key points, uh, so Argo workflows. As I said, it has many features. I included this screenshot uh, so you can see, you know, this is almost a dozen um, sections of the UI. Uh, and it's becoming very complex, uh, and we need contributions. Uh, so if there's one takeaway from this talk, uh, please help with Argo Workflows UI. Um, and uh, I think it's especially important to consider Polish because there are a lot of new features that are on the bleeding edge, you could say. Um, we need to sort of bring it to a similar state that CD is in, where it's relatively mature and stable. Um, so yeah, Workflows, uh, we would appreciate help with Workflows. Uh, and then for CD, as I mentioned, it's pretty mature. Um, and it's important to consider that massive changes are going to be jarring to users. Uh, so I think while visual modernization, we need to do it, uh, we should also cons consider that we should evolve rather than uh, offer some sort of revolution to the Argo CD UI. Um, and we, of course, welcome new features as well. Uh, but I will talk about extensions in just a second. Uh, so before you consider adding a brand new feature to Argo CD UI, uh, maybe consider introducing it as an extension um, to help grow this new section of the UI. Um, so moving on to extensions, uh, this QR code will link you to the documentation for creating an Argo CD extension. Uh, so feel free to scan it. Um, and if you guys are not aware, uh, we introduced extensions relatively recently. Uh, and this is a powerful new way to add functionality to Argo CD's UI. Um, so Essentially, I'll show you a screenshot in the next slide, but uh, you can extend the UI with your own uh, subsets of the UI, so your own components, uh, your own React components. 
Uh, and it's pretty easy to, to get started with it. It's easy to develop them. Um, and there's no need to wait for PR reviews and releases. I think uh, Bala mentioned plugins for Argo workflows. This is similar. Uh, plugins are sort of beyond UI, but this is purely UI. And you don't have to wait for us to review your PRs, because sometimes that can take a while. Um, we're busy, and, and it might get swept under the rug. So this is a really easy way for you even to introduce private functionality uh, only for your company. So if you have a really specific use case that your company um, would like to introduce to the UI, you can absolutely do this. Um, and we tend to believe that this is the future of the UI for Argo, um, most likely for workflows as well. Um, we'd like to add some sort of extensibility to workflows. Uh, but certainly for CD, uh, this is where CD is headed because it's so extensible, because it's future proof. Um, and I will mention too that Argo Rollouts dashboard, uh, it was created as an extension. Um, and again, I'll show you a screenshot in just a second, but uh, we're also gonna be adding application level extensions, uh, or that's already introduced, I think. Um, if it's not introduced already, it will be soon. Um, and then sidebar extensions as well. This is something in progress. Um, so multiple areas of extension. And then Leo uh, also has a PR open for uh, introducing reverse, reverse proxy functionality to extensions. Uh, so this should make it a lot more powerful as well. Uh, and this is the QR code for that proposal if you guys wanna take a look um, at that reverse proxy proposal. Uh, and here is a screenshot of uh, the Rollouts extension. So as you can see, it looks almost identical to the Rollouts dashboard, and that's because it is. Uh, essentially, the Rollouts extension is a repackaged version of the Rollouts dashboard. Um, and this is the primary example of an Argo CD extension. So uh, as you can see, you click on a resource in your resource tree uh, in one of your Argo CD applications. Uh, and there is an extra more tab uh, at the top right. You click on that. And if you have the extension installed for this specific CR, uh, that will be displayed. Um, so that, again, this is a role extension. So it's pretty easy to install. Um, and you can create extensions like this uh, to add more functionality to the UI. Um, all right, uh, so what now? Um, as Dan, I think, mentioned, we have the SIG UI meeting. It's the third Wednesday of every month, and that's going to be at 9 AM Pacific time. Uh, and we welcome you to open new issues or implement uh, fixes for old ones. Um, as I said, polish is really important, so maybe prioritize the bug fixes. Um, but again, we do welcome new features and new feature ideas. Even if you don't want to implement them, somebody else probably will. So please uh, feel free to open an issue. Um, and then uh, you could always help review existing PRs, uh, even if you're not a official maintainer that can uh, go ahead and approve a PR to be merged. Uh, feedback is always welcome, so feel free to pitch in your two cents. This is especially easy with UI. Um, it's usually good practice to include a screenshot if you open a UI PR. Um, so you can always take a look at the screenshots, and if you like what you see, uh, give it a thumbs up. If you don't, then feel free to leave a comment. Um, and then we also have the Argo SIG UI channel in the CNCF Slack. Um, so feel free to join that and uh, pitch in your opinions. Um, and then, yeah, feel free to come find me to chat. Uh, I'm always open to talk about UI issues um, and to hear new ideas. And uh, yeah, I'm always thinking about this. So uh, here are a couple QR codes to uh, UI issues. Uh, there's a UI label in Argo CD and in an Argo workflows. Um, so these are going to be issues specific to the UI. So um, feel free to scan these. And um, thank you. Thank you, Remington. So we have one last speaker who is going to talk about the most exciting topic, security. So please welcome Michael. Okay, I unironically love security, so I might not be all that relatable. Um, but I want to show folks a few ways they can contribute. Even if you don't like get super excited about security, oh yeah, we're going to keep bad guys out, then uh, there are ways you can still help the project, um, you know, in huge ways. So first, I want to show what, what Dan was talking about with the Argo Proj calendar. So if you go to the Argo Proj org and then hit the Argo Proj, it's a pinned repo. 
scroll down. Oops, we lost it. Scroll down to the bottom. It's a, the, the magic thing again. The magic thing. Okay. Yes. So if you click this, you can load the Argo Proj calendar into your calendar. For me, it was a bit of a trick to get it into Outlook, but very, very worth it because if you're having a slow day at work or whatever, you can just hop into one of our meetings um, and usually there's something interesting going on. Specifically, we have a security meeting um, every other week on Tuesdays. And the only way we know to design features, uh, particularly security features in a way that one, works for you and two, doesn't break your stuff is if we hear from you and, and you're in the discussions about how we're designing things. So uh, absolutely drop into the SIG security meetings. Um, we'd love to talk with you. Second thing, uh, write documentation. Um, right now, particularly Argo CD's documentation, and that's mostly what I'm gonna focus on is CD. It's written in a, here's how you get your Argo CD set up. Here's how you create a project. Here's how you create an application. Mm -hmm. I think that we would really benefit from documentation that is, okay, you've got all this set up. How do you retroactively look at it, tell if it's secure, and then if not, uh, make changes to secure it? And the people who can write that documentation the best are the people who have set up their own Argo CD instance and have considered, how do I get this secure? So um, we'd love to see PRs for that type of documentation. If you don't want to put up a PR against Argo CD, because then you have to know our markdown format, then you have to you know, work at getting reviews done, please write a blog post, even if it's a really short, simple blog post about your thoughts. Um, I wanted to call out one in particular that I love to see. Uh, Denilson Nastasio from uh, IBM wrote this blog post, and I just randomly saw it in a tweet. And this is fantastic writing. It talks about um, how you can harden an Argo CD instance. And the main thing it, I loved about it, it said, you have a default project that most people leave as is in their Argo CD instance, but that default project isn't locked down. And he describes how to lock it down. Um, so simple stuff like this, write it up, feel free to Slack it to me, uh, tweet about it, I'll see it. Um, I wanna see how people are thinking about security in their Argo CD instances. Uh, it really helps us. Uh, if you're more into code and less into docs, um, a couple places where you can start uh, are with this project in the Argo CD repo. Ada Logix uh, recently did a security audit for Argo CD and actually for all of the Argo products. And as part of that, they identified some CVEs. We got the CVEs fixed and the fixes pushed out, but they also identified just some like room for improvement areas. And we've written all those up into issues. Some of them are kind of big. A few of them are pretty small and simple. So drop into this project, uh, see if there are any issues that look like you could tackle. Some of them are just documentation. So even if you don't want to write code, um, that's all available for you. And there's also uh, a security label for issues um, that you can narrow down and look at what's available. Uh, one particular kind of issues issue that I'd like to see if folks are interested in, we created a new issue template uh, in the Argo CD repo for security logs. Um, so we're gonna try to identify areas of the code where the logging could benefit from highlighting, hi, this is security related. And here's how closely you should look at this logging event. Um, so for example, we've started adding logging for when Argo CD fails to close a file. You can just ignore that error and move on, but you could run into issues where uh, your controller is running out of resources. So we wanna log that event and give admins the opportunity to monitor that and tell if there's potentially a security issue. So if there's something that happens in Argo CD that you're like, I'd wanna know about that as a security person, uh, then open an issue, tell us about it, and we can add um, the structured logging to make it easier for your security folks to find those events. Let's see, one last thing I'm gonna talk about uh, is um, spend some time and, and ask your bosses for time to audit your Argo CD instance and sit down and just look at your RBAC config and consider how would I attack this? Uh, consider how you're allowing people to get manifests and resources into Kubernetes via Git repositories. 
you lock down your Git repositories with code owners files or with GitHub groups. Just ponder how you would break your security model. And then if there are issues, uh, then obviously fix them. And please write about it or create a discussion in the GitHub repo or talk about it in our security meetings. Um, if there aren't any issues and you think I just have a really awesome Argo CD security setup, then please write how you're doing that uh, and blog about it because companies are going to secure their stuff in completely different ways. Um, and it's really helpful for us to know what those different ways are so that Argo CD can provide first class support for all those different methods of securing. Uh, so that's all I have for security. I'll pass it back to Alex for Q and A, and then I think we're going to Henrik after um, you. Okay. Yep, after Q and A. Yeah, cool. Yeah, so. <clears throat> yeah. And yes, as Michael said, it's time for you to ask questions. Um, feel free to, I guess, address it to any of the speakers or to me. I don't have a question, but a comment. Uh, somebody left a Mac charging cable over here. So if you were sitting right over here <laughs> and you're missing the cable here. I think I will, yeah, maybe we'll get it we'll, and, and store it somewhere here. Maybe like OK, any, any questions about Argon? <clears throat> yes, please. The two uh, links you had to the UI, mm -hmm. CDN workflows. Can we get that slide back? Um, I are... don't have it anymore. Um, yeah. Can you pull up the presentation? I'll get it. Mm -hmm. I closed the window. Yeah, I will get them in like a couple minutes. Maybe to provoke some questions, I have questions for you. Like, anyone here contributed to Argo besides you know, maintainers team? Awesome. So maybe any, any any stories you want to share about your contribution experience, and that can <laughs> maybe you have a question or request of input. <coughs> And may I ask which project? Uh, workflows. Workflows. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. So so yeah. So th this is we just have a few more minutes available just for any maintainer Q and A at all. Uh, there are a number of maintainers in the room. So if it's hey, I'm looking for this feature. When is that going to be available? Uh, why did you make this architectural decision um, that I hate? Uh, <laughs> why did you do this one that I love? Um, any of those kinds of things. Roadmap questions. Yeah, I got one. Uh, actually, we're raising how to manage our current infra infrastructure. Uh, is there any way to, I, I see there is a way to integrate Helm and Argo CD. Uh, is it the, the first class citizen, the, the Helm? Uh, because it seems that you're describing deployments in, in kind of your own custom way uh, and applications, but we really use how to package our application. So is that a first class citizen? Uh, again, uh, so your, your question is, is Helm a first class citizen within Argo CD, essentially? I mean, I think so. What do you think, Alex? Uh, yes. So I think maybe uh, there are like two answers. One, Helm is the first class citizen. We definitely, uh, Argo CD integrates with Helm and let users deploy their applications using Helm. Uh, and then we also, another aspect is we have Helm chart for Argo CD. And I'm not sure if you asked about that. If uh, 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 let me explain it. Uh, in more details. And, and speak up a bit. And we'll uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, I, I am, by the way, from EA, uh, which is Electronic Arts. Uh, so we do package our applications as a Helm chart. Mm -hmm. And currently, we are doing just simple uh, uh, pipelines to deploy them. Mm -hmm. Just run simple Helm apply, and it goes to Kubernetes, right? Yep. So we want to keep uh, the same feature, just package all applications, but switch to uh, Argo as the CI CD. Yeah, let's support it. Argo CD yeah. has two ways to support Helm. First, you can just have your Helm chart in Git repository, 
point Argo CD to the Helm chart and it will uh, figure out what parameters you can specify. It lets you give parameters values uh, in the Argo CD UI itself without even <coughs> committing it back to Git. And also Helm, like you can use Helm repository directly. It doesn't have to be committed to Git. Uh, and then 2.5 release that's coming hopefully you know, soon in like a week or two. It even supports one additional use case where you can take the Helm uh, repository plus a Git repo and feed a values file from Git repo into like basically combine those two repos uh, to produce your final manifest. So yeah, I think it's basically it. the Helm is very, very supported as much as yeah. customized. And and uh, even like um, help most Helm hooks are re-implemented uh, within Argo. Yes. There are a few exceptions, but like I think Helm test isn't or something. But most of them are. That's uh, actually yeah, since you ask and we don't have that many questions. Yes, Helm hooks are supported as well, uh, except few Helm, Helm like very specific Helm hooks. So in particular, Argo CD don't support test because it's like doesn't make sense to run tests. Uh, like there is no room in Argo CD world for Helm tests, and we do not have install uninstall events because it's kind of in GitOps. You, it's hard to say when you, if you install an application for the first time, or maybe you deleted all your resources in production and just reapply and finish it. So yeah. only those two type of hooks not support. Michael, yeah, Michael. I can add something. So Argo CD uses Helm to generate manifests. And then it uses those, it uses QCTL to apply those manifests to the cluster. If your developers are super used to like using the Helm install command, and I think their Helm commands to list releases, et cetera, that's not available because we don't use Helm to actually install releases. We just use it to build manifests, and then that goes to the cluster. So a bit of a dev workflow change. Yeah, but. Luckily, once they have Argo CD, all the applications would be listed as well. So you just do Argo CD list, app list. Uh, but this is true of the entire like approach to manifests. Argo CD at the end of the day is just going, it's going to end up with manifests to apply through whatever config management tool you're using. And Argo CD is not really opinionated about that. Helm is the one that has the most opinion because it has like in the UI like Helm repo, you know, you can actually switch from Git to Helm repo to specify it, but none of the others really require that. Yeah, good question. Um, has there been any consideration of expanding the functionality of Argo rollouts to more resource types? Uh, not because of the, be able to use the metrics of the analysis templates to be able to do things like, oh, I rolled out a new daemon set, let's say, and based upon the metrics now that that daemon set's generating rollback, the previous image that that daemon set was running that type of functionality yeah so the question was is there are there any plans to have argo rollout support resources beyond just basically deployments and i think jesse's going to come answer mm -hmm. so that would be really cool <laughs> <laughs> so uh stateful set is i think the second most requested um argo rollout feature after the um auth dashboard um it's it's gonna it would be nice to support it it is gonna be pretty challenging because um if you think about the way rollouts work it's actually um implemented as as a drop-in replacement for a deployment resource so it creates and manages replica sets um, but if you know uh, what a stateful set is like it's it creates pods uh, directly and has things called controller revisions. And so it's actually a completely different implementation uh, and the same is true for uh, daemon set. And so to implement and support stateful set, we, we would have to uh, go through that same process of um, uh, kind of replicating the, the logic. We actually import and reuse a lot of logic of, of upstream Kubernetes for um, the deployment um, functionality, uh, but we would have to kind of repeat that. The other consideration about this is that um, uh, their rollout is equivalent to a deployment, but those two other resources are actually, um, you know, different uh, resource kinds. And you don't want to say a rollout can do both, like the, the functionality of a daemon set, a stateful set, and a deployment, because, you know, daemon sets are much more impactful to a cluster. So 
um, we would have to introduce a, um, a daemon set equivalent. Um, so with all that said, it I think it is kind of a, a stretch goal, I would say. To, but, um, and there is um, some effort to extrapolate some of the reusable components that we did that uh, to kind of lay the groundwork for e more easily being able to support um, um, those type of stateful um, workloads. But it's, I would say it's, it's going to be a long road. If you have a brilliant idea for how to implement it and want to get started, we could probably get you a startup just around that problem, <laughs> just some investment money. Um, not directly related to that question because it's not actually an auger rollouts thing, but there is a really interesting feature coming from the community that hasn't been accepted yet. The proposal hasn't been accepted, but to support rollouts across application sets, which that. would be yeah. more like fleet management. Yeah, and you've been following us. So. Well, obviously, the UI and Augur workflows allows you to update parameters or templates and stuff. Have any thoughts around being Augur to be write that back to Git? So, being tricky docs, if you change parameter, write that back to Git or update a workflow, you write that back to Git. Yeah, so the question is um, Is there any idea of having the UI so that when you make a change in the UI, having that right back to Git instead of just having it change the UI? And I, I think the answer is no, but I mean, what what would you say? Because you, you look like you had a different idea. Uh, there, there is a hidden feature actually that's made us kind of half there. So it is possible to create a special file in Git. And if you call that file dot argo cd dash source, then argo cd will kind of take a look at this file and it will assume that inside of that file you have a YAML, which is application source, and it will try to kind of merge parameters from that file into parameters already specified in source during during manifest generation and uh, image updater uses that feature so and basically we didn't get a lot of like requests to to so that the last thing that we have to do is to just teach argo cd to manage that file in git and that kind of gives you like a universal api to change any parameters uh, so basically argo cd don't have to understand if it's customized or helm uh, to write changes back to Git because it's all now encapsulated in a single file. Yeah, so I guess if you uh, if you like the idea to teach Argo CD to do that, maybe create an issue and see how many thumbs up you get. But we're kind of close to to support it. Yeah, that's so my okay. answer was no, and yours was no, but maybe. <laughs> um, yeah. Yes, yeah. The main main problem with the feature is like. It's against a little bit against GitOps approach. Uh, so kind of like some people think it's controversial a way to manage manifests because yeah, you get like two source of truth. So on one hand you have maybe a customization uh, config plus a bunch of YAML files and it produces your set of manifests. But Argo CD will take the same set of you know configurations and apply this magic file on top and produce a completely different source. So, yeah, that's... And maybe I'll just add. So I think also with the, the extension functionality with combined with the proxying uh, portion of the extensibility, um, I can imagine a world where someone writes an Argo CD extension with the, a backend that introduces a button in the, in the interface that says like, sync this live state to back to get and then um so i think to me i think those type of you know some maybe more controversial features or things that maybe to kind of keep the the argo cd from getting bloated i, I feel like extensions is like the right mechanism in the future to handle um these type of things yeah good question other questions uh Question for the workflows maintainers. Um, they have left the building. That's the question. Uh, are any workflows maintainers in the room? Yes, yes. Oh, Bala? Yeah, come on up, Bala. Bala. My question is uh, why should I use a Argo workflows plugin instead of just wrapping up the functionality I'm interested in in a workflow template? So, in workflow template? So, why, so, why use a plugin instead of just like a 
a regular pod based template. Bonnick, Bonnick, I failed this one. Oh, Alex is here too. <laughs> <laughs> So, so like in loads of cases, you want to use template because um, users will just have a template that's easy to use. My voice is quite loud. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Louder that's still. Good. Cool. Yeah, workflows are usually easier for users to use. Um, a, a plugin is intended to be um, allow you to avoid running pods effectively as part of your workflow. So when a plugin executes a task, it spins up a single container, I think that lives with the pod, with the agent pod, and that container executes those tasks in sequence. So it uses less resources than a template. It doesn't spin pods up and down to complete each task. So that's one reason. It's a different security model as well. Um, and the idea about plugins is they're intended to be a bit more shareable and reusable than workflow templates. So you can publish them on the internet and then other people can consume them. Then one more thing is like, uh... Workflow template is like a namespace code. A cluster template, you can use it, but you cannot give like a privilege to that all the namespace like accessing a cluster template. If you install that the plugin in your controller, it will be available for all the namespaces with the multi-tenant or banks. So you no need to like uh, enable the cluster workflow template for each namespace, giving a permission and everything. We had another one over here. Yeah. Yeah, I got two questions. Uh, first question Is there going to be any more love given to Argo workflow catalog so that it's a little more akin to like GitHub Actions? Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, we can create a plugin catalog so you guys can contribute it. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it's just genuinely quite hard to make really generic reusable work by templates. It's, it's, it's a fundamental issue. And a catalog requires um, uh, curation. So it takes quite a lot of time and effort to curate. Uh, Codefresh made one at the risk of being inappropriate in the event maintainer QA. Uh, second question. So I have a workflow that does CI CD, and it's basically a list generator to an app set so like different environments are updating like the same file like very rapidly is there any way to like kind of better integrate like uh, lots or anything i know there's mutex but like it gets kind of sometimes it bugs out and i, I get issues with like a merge conflicts on like that one file the app set. Is there any suggestions there or features? So Mutex is the right way to um, lock exclusive resources with workflows. Yeah. But it's buggy and that's because it, it's either uh, you know a bug that can be addressed with, with a fix, <laughs> or if there's a uh, if the technique or the approaches of using a mutex is uh, is efficient. Yes. Maybe you have like a deadlock. I think it's doable to do it with the, the new text. Uh, maybe I need to do some improvements on my end, but I was wondering if there's going to be any sort of like bridge <laughs> to like dealing with app sets. Can I ask about this case? So you're updating Argo CD app set? Yeah, so, so I have um, an app set, right? I have like a like one file with all my dev environments for that app, like staging, production. And, you know, developers are pushing their changes on their branches and stuff like, you know, concurrently very rapidly. So when the workflow triggers, like if there, sometimes there could be some sort of issue, like for example, I got a 502 with the GitHub one time and then they tried to retry it. And then there are some issues with like, uh, I think like the way that we were doing like pull requests, but sometimes there's like uh, like merge conflicts just because like, you know, maybe they push like very close together. Um, I, get, I think I can add like a pull and like a mutex and, just, and some retries, but like I was wondering if there's a better way. Because you are committing them. Yeah. Yeah. I think the question was meant to replace a step of workflow. 
source. So application is supposed to keep checking whatever source of new you configure, and every time it finds something new, it's supposed to just just start using it. So maybe one option is to do not use application set and then create applications using the code for that. That's an option. Or maybe try to see if. Figure out what application should be. Maybe you can. Take offline. Okay, offline discussion. You got you got offline. That was too good of a question. Um, I think we have time for like one more. Yeah, one more, one last juicy question. Yeah. Uh, are there any plans to make the application controller in our CD uh, more scalable dynamically? Oh, okay. Is there going to be plans to make dynamic scalability for Argo CD application controller? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I can update you about the progress. So there is. Uh, and the, at least we had a plan, which is kind of like struggle to execute it. But idea was that we introduced the uh, sharding, which is a way to shard, you know, have many controllers serving a bunch of clusters. It was just scary to. We just learned that it's kind of expensive to reshard because every time you change the way you assign clusters, uh, in most cases all controllers has to stop and restart from like from zero. That takes like a couple minutes. So what we did was we <clears throat> we developed a, a command that go through all the clusters and tries to decide what's the best way to shard. And the idea was to have this uh, CLI command available in Argo CD binary itself. And then we were, we were hoping to offer people just a cron to have a cron job that you can run that cron job maybe like once a day because clusters are not get added that frequently. And hopefully the command would just do nothing most of the time. If you add a new cluster, it, it would reshard uh, and you know pr provide a better balancing. So the current state is uh, this pull request is pretty much ready to get merged. It's just missing tests. And I guess the main reason is uh, not that many people in the world need it. Like, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, yeah, my current problem is that I have maybe like a dozen application controllers and they use a very lopsided amount of resources because not mm -hmm. everything is balanced equivalently across mm -hmm. all the clusters that I'm deploying to. So I have to like dynamically, or I have to size them all for the largest application controller. Mm -hmm. And I would much prefer it if the application controllers could balance among themselves mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. load needs to be passed yeah. out and also allow them to scale up and down dynamically based on um, how many applications are running. Yeah. So I basically, I think I can just um, I can promise to, to finally finish it because it's so, so close to be ready. And then as soon as it's merged, I think you can just give it a try. Uh, you know, like you will get, so once it's merged, there will be an image in Docker Hub that has this command. Oh. And it's kind of trivial to use. You just need to package it into a cron job that has permissions to, ma to manage uh, stateful sets. It, Oh, sorry, not state uh, it needs permissions just to like it fits in Argo CD namespace. And that's, I guess, the biggest, it's really difficult to test if it is used, you know, if it's effective or not. So, in theory, it should work. You know, if you test it, that will be a big help. Yeah, and then we can document how people should use it and we can refer to your example and say that, yeah, it, it did help. And then another thing to know about it currently, it, it uses. Basically, the first attempt to implement proper sharding or balancing was to really imp implement a fancy, um, uh, you know, dynamic programming algorithm that tries to iterate through all possible ways to distribute uh, clusters and and provide the best one. It works on like ten clusters. If you have like four hundred clusters, it it takes one hour, <laughs> which it just doesn't work it. So right now there is a kind of primitive way. It just tries to assign clusters and pick the best 
Yeah, so it's kind of naive implementation, but it works. And then I was testing it on large number of, of clusters, and it was as good as, you know, it was not much of a difference between fancy algorithm. So if your testing proves the same, then that, that, that's good enough. How many clusters? Uh, 30-ish? About 30. Okay, then it's all right, there's a PR to get involved in. Uh, so with that, I think we're gonna close the Q&A. Thank you for all of the questions. And if you wanna track any of us down during the happy hour, just you know, speak loudly and make noise as you approach.